Reverend Barb Ellerby is a disruptor. One of her assignments from God is to meet you where you are and then disrupt you by teaching you to replace who man says you are to who Abba Father sees you as and calls you to be. In these broadcasts, Reverend Barb will provide his word as a means of breaking old thought patterns and embracing his truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. And that's not all he says about you. It's time for you to walk in your Ephesians 2.10 self as his unique masterpiece, recognizing he has called you and created you and I for such a time as this. Now sit back and enjoy tonight's broadcast. Good evening, family, and welcome to our Worthy Child Ministry. My name is Reverend Barbara Ellerby, and we're going to start with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to look at your word. We say, speak, Lord, speak, come, Holy Spirit, come, touch and anoint each and every one of us. Father, change our hearts, give us a greater hunger and thirst for you, a relationship with you like never before. Open up our eyes, our ears, our heart, our mind, our spirit, that we would hear clearly from you and that we would move in obedience to you. We thank you for being God of another chance, another chance, and even more chances. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you're with us constantly. There's no way we can even escape you. We thank you, Lord, for even at our most unlovable, you still love us. Father, we ask, Lord, that as we look at tonight's subject, Lord, that you bring clarity and understanding to each and all of us, that none of us would leave here the same way we came in. Father, we ask, Lord, these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. All right, family, so on Communion Sunday, the message was choice. And um, I talked about different areas that we have uh, for choice. And I choose to write myself notes and I still ignore them. Uh, I'll get back to the message in a minute, but uh, a reminder this Saturday, we're doing part two of our forgiveness conference. Um, I will have a panel consisting of Pastor Anthony Davis, Brother Victor Alisea, as well as myself. We will be um, discussing the subject of unforgiveness. Uh, the first session that we did was a couple weeks ago in October, and uh, we still have people reaching out with comments and questions as to how much they appreciated, how much clarity they got. And there was a shift in us as a panel in different areas that we got clarity on as well. Um, it is a very, very important subject without forgiveness we would be nothing. Just the fact that because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are now able to be forgiven. We are now able to, excuse me, spend time with God and him hear us and not see us as the sinful creatures that we are, but to see us as forgiven and loved. So if you get the opportunity, we'll be on this Saturday the 12th um, from 1 to 3.30, if you have questions about the subject on forgiveness, please reach out to me, either email or if you know me, call me, or you can reach out on Facebook um, if you have any questions or even comments. Um, yeah, uh, later on this month, we'll also be doing a special program on the 22nd, uh, the fourth Tuesday of the month. Uh, I have a special guest that will be with us, Reverend Dr. Laverne Hall, and we'll be talking about um, National African American Clergy Women Awareness Month. Uh, she spoke to us a couple years ago, and I've asked her to come back in part because I, I think that the projects that she's working on are very exciting and very interesting. Um, but she has a history that I don't have per se 
that can um, bring more clarity and understanding as to what women have had to deal with that have been called by God to bring his word. So I'm looking forward to her. Uh, as I told Pastor Chris, she's a tiny little woman. She's about, I think she's four foot 11, four foot 10. She's a powerful little woman. My earliest remembrance of, of her meeting her on Facebook was catching her when she was praying. She would pray a prayer as like a devotional and then she'd go on about her business. But when she prayed, I always felt as though it was a hug for my grandmother. She's not old enough to be my grandmother, but it's just the warmth and the love that I feel when I just hear her talk. She's just such a strong and beautiful woman. I'm looking forward to uh, spending the time with her. So again, keep this Saturday in mind, keep the 22nd in mind. And of course, I'll be here each, each Sunday as well. But the subject we're looking at tonight is entitled If, If, I-F. One of the books I had looked at as I was researching said that it is a small world word, but is a powerful word. In looking it up, there was one article that said that it is the word if appears in the Bible 1,521 times. And that's 1,029 times in the Old Testament and 492 times in the New Testament. And that's in the King, King James translation. Um, the modified King James version, it appears 1,670 times. And you probably wonder why is she giving me these numbers? Because it's, it's a conditional word. It's a pivotal word. It's a word that um, causes us to make a move to do a thing. So as we talk about this subject, I wanna give you a definition for um, if is introducing a conditional clause such as in the event of, um, if we do our part, then God does his part, but we have to do our part and meet the condition. So tonight I wanna just go through some scriptures with you that have that conditional clause in there to give you an idea. But before I do that, I, wanna, I want you to think about relationships that you're in, whether it is um, siblings, parents, um, friendships, um, romantic relationships, there are times when if is spoken and there's times when if is implied. And it is so important that we know the heart of the people that we're dealing with in our lives. All of the people that we know have pet peeves, things that make us crazy. One of my pet peeves is lateness. I'm generally never late. I am that person who, if we said we're gonna meet at one, I'm standing there a quarter to one looking for you, trying to figure out why you're late, why you're not there. And it's 15 minutes before the agreed upon time. But in my head, it, if you're not there a quarter to two, you're running late. The thing for you to know is I have an issue with time. My if is, if you get there on time at one o'clock, we'll be good. If you don't, we'll have a problem. Other pet peeves, one that I have is, I find myself doing it sometimes is clicking an ink pen. If you are around me and you start clicking an ink pen, you will get a response. It's not like it used to be, I'm way calmer now but it would be something that would bother me. And I will tell you, please stop clicking that pen because it's very frustrating to me. Um, back in the day, I would have said, and if you don't stop, I'll take it, okay? So I'm using those as an example for, for you to understand that in relationships that we have, even the most base relationships that we have, there are many times ifs involved. A Rohi's Child Ministry is about encouraging us to move into a stronger, more intimate relationship with God. And in doing that, we need to find out the things that make him unhappy. We also need to find out the promises that are available to us. And that's done 
in reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on the word. That intimacy is built that way as well as prayer, praise and worship, fasting and giving. These are the actions we do on our part to get this relationship with him into more depth. In doing that, we get to know him better. So as I said, tonight, I wanna to look at some scriptures that give us some understanding as to who God is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I wanna start with Deuteronomy 28. And it's a very interesting chapter because the subheading begins with blessings for obedience. And then the second part of the chapter is curses for disobedience. <clears throat> I'm not gonna read the whole chapter, but I wanna read parts of it to you for you to get an understanding of, of what I'm referring to. So Deuteronomy 28 begins in chapter, verse one, excuse me. If you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the world. You'll experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your town and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offsprings of your herd and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit basket and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will scatter from you. They will, scat they will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter from you in seven directions. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouse with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his way, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in all of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give to you blessing you with many children, numerous livestock and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless all the work you do. You will lend to many nations, but you will never need to borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord, your God that I'm giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will always be on top and never at the bottom. You must not turn from any of the commands I'm giving you today, nor follow after other gods or worship them. So what we have is Moses laying out to the children of Israel. If you do these things, mainly obey God. And obeying him and loving him, it's, it's almost like a cycle. The more you love him, the more you obey him. The more you obey him, the more you love him, okay? So Moses shared this with the children of Israel, reminding them that if they stayed obedient to the word of God, God would bless them in all these areas. Now, the one scripture that I read the last part um, should sound familiar because you probably heard people say, you are the head and not the tail. You always be on top or above and never at the bottom. And it's very seldom in context, people will, talk to you when you're down, when you're frustrated, when you're upset, when you wanna give up and they'll say, or if you're in warfare, they'll say, but you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. And we're pulling that phrase, that scripture, that verse, because of the power that it has. But let's put it in the correct context. It comes as part of a scripture in which God is, I mean, Moses is saying that if you do these things, God will bless you these ways. So we just can't wake up, live any old way we want to live, act any old way we want to act, walk around telling people we're a Christian and not be a Christian, not move in a way that honors God, and then have the audacity to expect him to bless us, have the audacity to expect him to help us to be that head and not the tail. Because we're in we're not fulfilling our part of the contract. When we look at the New Testament, one of the scriptures that I share a lot is found in Matthew. And it's when the Pharisee said to Jesus, what 
is the greatest command. And Jesus tells them to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, okay? If we could move in that way, if we could love God, we would be more willing to obey God. If we loved ourselves, and then loved people the way we correctly love ourselves, not out of arrogance, pride, selfishness, self-centeredness, but to, to love ourselves as a creation of God who's been given purpose, who's been given um, gifts, assignments, works to do for God that are recipients of the love of God. If we could move like that, that love would transfer into relations with other people. Anybody that is not us is our neighbor, okay? So God is making a very clear command and a demand on us to love. Jesus was very clear in sharing that because you hear it in Deuteronomy 6 first, and then you hear it again in Matthew, and I believe Mark has it as well, but it's about that love relationship. So in loving God, because we love him, it should be so much easier to follow his commands. In the areas where we are weak, that's when we go to him to get the help and the strength um, and the support that we need. But this if word is just so important because it's reminding us, if I do my part, God is gonna do his part. If he can count on me to be focused, to be loving to other people, He's going to bless me at least as much as I'd be a blessing to other people. We don't think about that, though. We just many times just go through life living the way we live, not recognizing this covenant that we have with God, the fact that he wants to bless us. He'll chastise us as necessary, but he wants to bless us and he wants to use us. And he wants to use us for his glory to grow his kingdom. But so many times we get caught up in our stuff and we're not as willing to be available to do the things he wants done. This Bible that we have access to, we have access in a multitude of ways that would get his word buried into our heart and our mind and our spirit that would draw us closer to him. And again, the closer we get to him, the better we know him. The better we know him, the less intimidated we'll be about going to him for the help that we need, for the strength and the guidance that we need. So as I read, this first part of this chapter is about the blessings of being obedient. There are the Ten Commandments that are available to help guide us in how we walk this walk. Now, the interesting thing is in the Jewish culture, they had 613 rules that they had to follow, but not only did they have to follow them, they had to learn them, okay? And they'd be able to recite them. I don't know if I could have done all 613. Um, I'm sure that they poured time into it with the boys so that they learned the, um, the, so that they learned the laws and were able to recite them as needed. But when it's a relationship of love, it's not as much a focus on the law and the penalty. It's following the rules or the law because of the love we have for God. And because this is the relationship that it is, if we do our part, if we walk in love, that keeps us from having anything block us so that God can't hear us. If we're moving in obedience to God, we're more inclined for the blessing. If we're moving in disobedience, there are curses involved. And I wanna share this part of Deuteronomy 28, which again is subtitled curses for disobedience. And it begins, but if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all of the commands and decrees I am giving you today, all of these curses will come and overwhelm you. Your towns, 
and your fields will be cursed. Your fruit basket and bird boards will be cursed. You, your children and your crops will be cursed. The offsprings of your herds and flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. The Lord himself will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in everything you do until at last you are completely destroyed for doing evil and abandoning me. The Lord will afflict you with diseases until none of you are left in the land you're about to enter and occupy. The Lord will strike you with wasting diseases, fever and inflammation with scorching heat and drought and with blight and mildew. These disasters will pursue you until you die. The skies above will be as unyielding as bronze and the earth beneath will be as hard as iron. The Lord will change the rain that falls on your land into powder and dust will pour down from the sky until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated by your enemies. You will attack your enemies from one direction, but you will be scattered from them in seven. You will be an object of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your corpses will be food for all the scavenging birds and wild animals, and no one will be there to chase them away. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with, tu and with tumors, scurvy, and the itch from which you cannot be cured. The Lord will strike you with madness, blindness, and panic. You will grope around in broad daylight like a like a blind person groping in the darkness, but you will not find your way. You will be oppressed and robbed continuously and no one will come to save you. You'll be engaged, engaged to a woman, but another man will sleep with her. You will build a house, but someone else will live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will never enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be butch butchered before your eyes, but you will not eat a single bite of the meat. Your donkey will be taken from you, never to be returned. Your sheep and goats will be given to your enemies and no one will be there to help you. You will watch as your sons and daughters are taken away as slaves. Your heart will break for them, but you won't be able to help them. A foreign nation you have never heard about will eat the crops you work so hard to grow. You will suffer under constant oppression and harsh treatment. You will go mad because of all the tragedy you see about you. The Lord will cover your knees and legs with incurable boils and fat you will be covered from head to toe. Now, I'm gonna stop there because this goes on from to the end of the chapter, which ends with verse 68. And it just continues to tell you the curses that you will fall upon or will fall upon you because you chose to be disobedient. So we're not talking about when we accidentally messed up. We're talking about when we make a deliberate decision to disobey God. Now this was, again, Old Testament. With Jesus, we don't have the same scenario per se, but there are still, when we are willfully disobedient, there is an impact. Okay, there is a result of every action we do. But if you get the chance, read this 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, because when you, when you think about how much I read that was the blessing, okay, and you look at what I read and past what I read that was the curses, it's, it's like compounded curses on you. It doesn't just say God will curse you and you will die. I mean, it goes into depth as to the um, vast amount of ways you will be cursed because of your disobedience. And the sad thing about this is for most of us, we haven't read Deuteronomy 28 with, um, with a lot of interest or a lot of intention in following it. But think about this. These are the children of Israel that are with Moses that are fleeing Egypt, going to the promised land. And Moses is taking the time to go line by line with them to tell them, these are the things that will happen if you continue to disobey God. But these are the blessings that you'll receive if you follow him faithfully. 
they heard him read this to them. They had already seen the parting of the Red Sea. So it's not like, it's like, oh, that's just Moses speaking out of his ears again. He don't know what he's talking about. No, they have seen Moses bring the word of God constantly to them. When something's wrong, Moses shuts down and goes into prayer. So they know there's a reflect, uh, excuse me, a strong relationship between God and Moses. And he took the time to break it down in such a way that you could not say, I didn't realize I'd go through all that if I messed up. No, Moses took the time to explain as you read it in this chapter, the things that would befall them if they moved in disobedience to God. He told them using the if, if you follow God, he will bless you. If you follow his rules, laws, precepts, he will bless you. If you disobey all of this stuff and, or just some of this stuff could happen to you. They heard him but they didn't hear him. We, on the other hand, have the opportunity to read his word to get an idea as to how this if flows for us. But we still so many times walk in disobedience. We choose to move in selfishness versus selflessness. We choose to do the things that we wanna do to make us happy or the things that seem logical to us, not recognizing that disobedience is disobedience, sin is sin, and God is watching what we do and knowing. I mean, Psalm 139 just tells us, as you're thinking it, he's reading your thoughts. He knew what you were going to think before you thought it. He knew what you were going to say before you said it. We don't take this relationship with God as serious as we need to. So many times we are in that ATM mentality and it's especially frustrating right now in this season that we're in. Because as you look around the country, as you look around the world and you see all the unrest and all the craziness and, and all the hate-filled activities that are going on, all the mean-spiritedness that's going on. God is not pleased with this stuff. And scripture tells us judgment begins with the church. And there are pastors that know this, but they're not teaching the congregation so that we get on the right track to do the things we need to do. People are suffering needlessly. People are making bad decisions, again, selfish decisions, because they're thinking what I do is about me. It doesn't impact anybody else when yes, it does. As we look at, <clears throat> excuse me, where we are, even this day, we're looking at an election day that's not like too many others we've had in the past. And it's sad because in the ones before that were bad, we said, we've never seen anything like this before. And with this one, we've never seen anything like this before. But even above that, with the relationship that we're able to have with God, this is someone that wants to be more intimate with us than anybody else in our life. He has made it crystal clear how important we are to him. As I said previously, there's a book I read last year that the first little blurb at the top says, you are worth Jesus to God. The founding scriptures of this ministry. Um, excuse me, Genesis 16, 13, I had Hagar, and that's not a book of the Bible, but which Hagar says, you are the God who sees me. Ephesians 2, 10, we are his unique masterpiece. He has so intricately designed each one of us. He has given us gifts, skills, talents, and abilities, and he wants that love relationship with us. 
And he wants us to choose him and stop choosing the selfishness and the things of this world. So he gives us these ifs so we can understand if we do our part, he's going to do his part. So as I was preparing for this message, um, I felt led to go to a scripture that um, you hear all the time, especially right now. It's found in 2 Chronicles, the seventh chapter. And it starts, what I'm going to talk about starts at the 12th verse. It says, then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifice. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. This is the familiar part. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their lands. Now, we just keep hearing, if my people who are called by my name, we don't have a backstory on that either. If you were to take the time to read Second Chronicles, the sixth chapter, you will see a bunch of ifs there. And so with that being said, I wanna share part of this chapter with you. It starts off with a subtitle of Solomon praises the Lord. It says, then Solomon prayed, O Lord, you have said that you would live in a thick cloud of darkness. Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a place where you can live forever. Then the king turned around to the entire community of Israel standing before him and gave this blessing. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept the promise he made to my father David. For he told my father, from the day I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I've never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as the place where a temple should be built to honor my name. Now, here I've chosen a king to lead my people, Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem as the place for my name to be honored, and I have chosen David to be king over my people, Israel. Then Solomon said, my father David wanted to build this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, you want to build a temple to honor my name. Your intention is good, but you are not the one to do it. One of your sons will build the temple to honor me. And now the Lord has fulfilled the promise he made for I have become king in my father's place. And now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. I built this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark, which contains the covenant that the Lord made with the people of Israel. So this is again, Solomon making this announcement to the people as he's talking to God, but beginning to start a prayer. And the next thing that I'm going to share with you is that prayer. I'm not going to read the whole prayer because it is a very long prayer, but it starts off. It says that Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community of Israel, and he lifted his hands in prayer. So it goes on to describe the platform that he's standing on. And it says with his arms, excuse me, as his hands lifted towards heaven, he prayed, oh, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven and earth. You keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. You've kept your promise to your ser servant, David, my father. You made that promise with your own mouth and with your own hands, you fulfilled it today. And now, O oh Lord, God of Israel, carry out the additional promises you made to your servant, David, my father. For you said to him, if your descendants guard their behavior, and faithfully follow my law as you have done, one of them will always sit on the throne of God. Now, O Lord, God of Israel, fulfill that promise to your servant, David. But will God really live on earth among people? Why even the highest heavens can't contain you? How much less this temple I have built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea, O God, excuse me, O Lord, my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you. 
may you watch over this temple day and night, the, this place where you have said you would put your name. May you always hear the prayers I make towards this place. May you hear the humble and earnest request from me and your people, Israel, when we pray towards this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live. And when you hear, forgive. All right. So as Solomon is having this conversation, this prayer with God, he's again reminding God of the promises that God made. And I want to take a sidestep here for a second. Many times as we go through things in our life, if we would remember the promises that God has made to us and we remind him of those promises, not in a naggy, nasty, sarcastic, rude way. But if we were to say to him as um, Solomon did, you promised that if we did da 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 da, that one of my father's sons and our family would always sit on the throne. So reminding God of his word prompts him many times to solidify what you'll see next. With regards to this prayer that Solomon is praying, as again, I said, he uses a lot of ifs and I'm gonna share some more of those with you now. It says, if someone, he's talking to God, if someone wrongs another person and is required to take an oath of innocence, in front of your temple, in front of your altar at this temple, then hear from heaven and judge between your servants, the accuser and the accused. Pay back the guilty as they deserve. Acquit the innocent because of their innocence. If number two, if your people, Israel, are defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you, and if they turn back, number three, and acknowledge your name and pray to you here in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your people, Israel, and return them to this land you've given them to their ancestors. Number four, if, if the skies are shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you. Number five, if they pray towards this temple and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins because you have punished, punished them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people of Israel. Teach them to follow the right path and send rain on your land that you have given to your people as their special possession. Number six, if. If there's a famine in the land or a plague or crop disease or attacks of locusts or caterpillars or if your people's, number seven, enemies are on their land besieging their towns, whatever disaster or disease there is and if your people pray about their problems or sorrow, raising their hands towards this, this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and forgive. Give your people what their actions deserve, for you alone know each human heart. Then they will fear you and walk in your way as long as they live in the land you gave our ancestors. In the future, foreigners who do not believe, <coughs> excuse me, in the future, foreigners who do not belong to your people, Israel, will hear of you. They will come from distant lands where they hear of your great name and your strong hand and your powerful arm. And when they pray towards this temple, then hear from heaven where you live and grant what they ask of you. In this way, all of the people of the earth will come to know and fear you just as your own people, Israel, do. They too will know that this temple I've built honors your name. If your people go out where you send them to fight their enemies, and if they pray to you by turning towards the city you've chosen and towards this temple I've built to honor your name, then hear their prayers from heaven and uphold their cause. If they sin against you and who has never sinned, you might become angry with them and let their enemies conquer them and take them captive to a foreign land far away or near. But in that land of exile, they might turn to you in repentance and pray. We have sinned, done evil, and acted wickedly. If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of captivity and pray toward the land you gave to their ancestors, towards the city you have chosen, and towards the temple I have built in your honor, then hear their prayers 
and their petitions from heaven where you live and uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. Oh my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to all the prayers made to you in this place. And now arise, O oh Lord God, and enter your resting place along with the ark, the symbol of your power. May your priests, our Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your loyal servants rejoice in your goodness. O oh Lord, do not reject the king you have anointed. Remember your unfailing love for your servant, David. So Solomon has gone through this prayer and it's reminiscent of some of what I read in Deuteronomy. It goes back to this, if, if we do our part, the good part, then you do your part, the good part. But if we continue to do the bad things, then our expectation is that you're going to curse us. But he's saying, if we confess and repent, if we shift from our wicked ways, forgive us and help us to live in a way that honors you. Help us to be that example that others would see the things we've done wrong. They see us confess and repent and they see your mercy. They would see us mess up. They would know we were being evil and choosing to be rebellious, but they would see us confess and repent and they would see your mercy. That alone would attract people to God because they would see his mercifulness. But it's not just other people that in this prayer Solomon is talking to as he prays this prayer in front of the people, it's a reminder of them too. If you commit these sins, if you do these things, God is going to penalize you. However, if you confess and repent, he is faithful and he will forgive. So I wanted to share that with you so that when we look at 2 Chronicles 7, and we get to that 12 through 14 verse, it again gives you context because all we keep hearing people say is if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that we think we know what that scripture is about. And we do, if we humble ourselves as a nation, as we, if we humble ourselves as an individual, we'll see God move on our behalf in a different way. But let's be clear as to the history of why that even needed to be included in the Bible. The children of Israel, as much as God loved them, they did wicked things. And it, it, it's like, they, he would bless them. He would give them what they needed, what they wanted, and they'd be good. And they'd look over there and see something they wanted and they'd go get it. And they'd get jacked up, jacked around. And he, God would allow other countries to take them captive. And they would be enslaved, mistreated for years. And finally, the confessing and the repent repenting became pure confessing and repenting. Please, God, please, please rescue us from these people. So he would rescue them and he would destroy the enemies that he allowed to enslave them. But it was, again, about developing this relationship if we could become totally dependent on God and not the fickle people that we are, then we'd see the blessings and not the curses. We see the blessings and not be reaping the negativity that we've sowed. God is very clear about wanting this intimate relationship with us. He's very clear though that it's that there are conditions that need to be met, things we need to do on our part as well. And we're not held to all of this stuff that the children of Israel were held to because of Jesus. But we need to understand just how intricate God's plan is, just how intricate his thoughts are with us. As reading the one scripture that talks about there not being rain and that it would be dried up and turned to a powder, that's dust. We don't want no dust storm, we, we want rain, we want the water because we need it. 
So going back to Solomon, he's still dedicating this temple to God. So he finishes his prayer and it reads in the seventh chapter, the first verse, the subtitle, the dedication of the temple. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offering and sacrifices and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. I got to stop and think about that for a second. This is the, the grand opening of the temple. They are inviting God in. This is your place. And they have the appropriate sacrifices to get his attention. Solomon has prayed this prayer, has, has basically said, we'll, we'll behave, we'll do better. You know, we know that if we mess up, if we confess and repent, you got us, you love us. So now let me, let me give you this house that we built to honor you. It says the priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. The presence of God is so strong. His glory is so strong that it would just overwhelm. I mean, they're saying, that the temple is so full of his presence, the priests that are supposed to be the holiest people there could not even go in. And it's not about keeping people out, it's, it's helping us understand this, this presence of the Lord, how huge it is, how overwhelming it is. And we've been blessed because we are post Jesus. So we have, the ability to have the Holy Spirit dwell in us. There's times when you may go to a church service and you feel the presence of God like you've never felt it before and it can be so overwhelming to see it. And he's tempered himself down to allow us to be around him when he's in that state of glory because if he doesn't, pull back some we we just can't be there it's just too much so as the scripture goes on it says when the people when all the people of israel saw the fire coming down in the glorious presence of the lord filling the temple they fell face down on the ground and worship and praise the lord saying he is good his faithful love endures forever then the king and all the people offered sacrifices to the Lord. So it goes on to explain these sacrifices and it goes down further. It says Solomon then consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings in the fat of peace offering there because the bronze altar he had built could not hold all the burnt offerings, grains and sacrificial fat. For the next seven days, Solomon and all of Israel celebrated the festival of shelters. A large congregation had gathered from far away as Libo Hamath in the north and the Brook of Egypt in the south. On the eighth day, they had a closing ceremony for they had celebrate, celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival of shelters for seven days. Then at the end of the celebration, Solomon sent the people home they were all joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and to his people. Imagine being in the presence of God, not right up in there, but being even to the side for those days. You, you would be so full of joy. I mean, there you'd be overwhelmed. But to know that he was celebrating with you, he was being with you and they did not have the blessing of the Holy Spirit that's available to us. So going back to this seventh chapter, Second Chronicles, subtitle, The Lord's Response to Solomon. So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command 
grasshoppers to devour your, your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I've chosen this temple and have set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. And for you, if you faithfully follow me as David your father did, obeying all my commands and decrees and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty. For I've made this covenant with your father David when I said one of your descendants will always rule Israel. So that's the good if. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the decrees and commands I've given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot the people from this land I have given them. I will reject this temple that I've made holy to honor my name. I will make it an object of mockery and ridicule among nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled. They will ask, why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? And the answer will be because his people abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and they worshiped other gods instead and bowed down to them. This is why he has brought all these disasters on them. So as we read this and we look at the state of the world, we have to wonder if the things that are going on are part of God taking his hands back because we have become so wicked and so self-centered and so hateful and so mean-spirited. We are so contrary, so contrary to the word of God. And I don't, when I say we, I don't mean you and me personally, but we got some mess, mess with us as well. But the country itself, our government, those who are in positions of power and authority are moving in ways that we are, what we are reaping is not a good thing. If we look at Isaiah 61, it says the good news for the oppressed, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that the captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes a joyous blessing instead of a mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. We are off track. And as I said earlier, scripture tells us that the judgment of the Lord will begin in the house, in the church, with his people. Like never before, we need to be deepening our relationship with God. We need to be drawing as close to him as possible. We need to be praying, praising, worshiping. We need to be reading the word, studying the word, meditating on the word. We need to be fasting and we need to be giving and we need to be drawing as close to him, so close that you can't slip a piece of paper between us and him. Because things are ugly and after today, they might be even more ugly. People have moved into a mindset of they can just act any way they want to. In different areas of the country, behaviors are different. As I listen to people in New York speak out about the things that are going on there, and I sit back and I look at this community I'm in here, and it's kind of quiet. It's not totally quiet, but it's kind of quiet compared to the everyday 
atrocities in these big cities. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, if we would pray more, if we would confess our sins and the sins of our country and would seek his face, if we would seek to honor and obey him, we can see change, but the, the lack of unity in the Christian community is problematic because we can't get the religious leaders to come together in a way that would benefit us all and honor God. Because people are territorial. They think that if I have a service with you, you might take some of my people because they'll see that you do this differently than me. People have cut down on church attendance because originally of COVID and they got comfortable and they found a lot of, uh, online ministries that they could watch and not be obligated. Because when you're face-to-face, -face, especially in the smaller churches, when you're face-to-face, -face, somebody's gonna ask you to do something one day. Now the big mega churches, they ask you to do stuff different, but they ask corporately. They don't have as much time, unless they're really set up well, they don't have as much time to watch and say, okay, this is the 15th time she's been here. I see that her favorite color is purple. She gets along with the kids really good. Maybe we can draft her to be a Sunday school teacher or put her in training for the children's ministry. They got watchers and they probably do, but not to the degree if we're going to a smaller church where they'd say, okay, those same variables Let's approach her and see if she wants to do some work or let's approach him and see if they want to do some kingdom work. If we want to see change, it has to begin with each one of us. It has to begin with us sacrificing our time. And it sh we should think of it even as a sacrifice. It should be about us finding more time to spend with God. Number one, to pray for our brothers and sisters in this world, to pray for our country, to pray for our government. And when I say government, I mean the president, which is the executive branch, the legislative branch, which is Senate and House of Representatives, we need to pray for the Supreme Court. We need to pray for local government officials, state officials. We need to pray for our young people. We need to pray for our schools, our teachers. We need to pray for those in the medical field who have just had two, three, possibly even four of the, of the worst years of their lives dealing with COVID that won't die and go away. And now we have RSV at high rates. Babies are getting snatched up and taken to the hospital again. We need to pray for people like funeral directors who have had to deal with death after death after death. Grave diggers who've had to deal with death after death after death. And we got to move past these ATM prayers of Oh, I forgot to pray. Dear Lord, please bless me and my family. Good night, amen. We have got to step outside ourselves. We have got to remember that this relationship with God is a relationship. That it's not just about us reaching out to him when we want or need something. It's about getting to know him and to know what he stands for and what offends him. We are covered by grace, mercy, favor. We are covered by the blood of the lamb, covered by Jesus. We are blessed to have the Holy Spirit indwell in us. That small, still voice that lets you know when you messed up and did the wrong thing or don't do it. We are blessed with a God who has said he will never leave us or forsake us. So we have all these blessings on this side. What are we doing 
for his kingdom? What are we doing for his people? What are we doing to bless this country? There's a group of women that pray with me every morning and a prayer that the Lord impressed on my heart. I wanna say it's been close to a year is to pray that God protects this country and the world from Russia, China, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Turkey, and North Korea, and now Italy and Hungary, because Italy and Hungary are two of the countries that have verbalized that they don't see a whole lot wrong with what Putin is doing. There are so many things that we need to be praying about, that we need dedicated prayer time each day to spend that time in prayer, getting to pray to God and to hear his voice when he answers those prayers. No prayer is a wasted prayer. Even if you don't see the results immediately, it's not a wasted prayer. This God who wants us to bring everything to him. And he's given us these guidelines in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. And it boils down to how much do you love him? Do you love him enough to spend time with him? Do you love him enough to push some of this other stuff to the side. Because the scripture is, is very clear when it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and I will hear from heaven and will forgive them their sins and heal their land, you know. I know this land needs to be healed. There's so much, as I said earlier, nastiness, mean behavior. That's just totally unnecessary. So much anger and hate and fear. And we know God is not pleased. And in some areas we've turned a blind eye. We don't have to pay attention to it because it doesn't affect us. It might not in this moment, but there's an impact. And you won't, might not get hit by the initial issue, but you might get hit by the impact. So we need to pray off of this country, a spirit of bullying and manipulation, racism, hatred. We need to pray and ask God to remove those things and to heal our land. The humbling of ourselves, it's just go before him. And go to him with a heart of worship first. And then pray that he covers the land, that he changes the hearts of the people. Especially those who call themselves Christian and are walking in such a hateful way. Scripture tells us that we will be accountable for every foolish word that was spoken. We speak a lot of foolish words. In this season, my prayer is that you get an opportunity, read these scriptures for yourself, but you increase your prayer life, that it expand past you and yours. and not just to say world peace. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I truly believe that if we pray out and we identify these issues, these concerns, God is faithful. Sometimes he's just waiting for us to lift a prayer. So I encourage you, get your time in with him and begin to pray like never before. Let us pray. And again, I will hopefully see you Saturday between 1 to 3.30, or you'll see us in our discussion on forgiveness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you, and we praise you, and we thank you. Father, we thank you for the word if that reminds us that this is a relationship that if we do our part, you're going to do your part. So prick our heart, our mind, and our spirit. Show us what 
the part is that we need to do, make it crystal clear. Sometimes we're confused and don't know what we might need to do in a situation, but we're asking Lord for mercy, favor, and healing that you would open up our eyes, ears, heart, mind, and spirit, that we would hear clearly from you, then we would move in obedience to you. Let us be reminded that for every action we take, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Sometimes even a bigger reaction than we think. So help us, Lord, to do the things that please and honor you, that give you glory. When we feel tempted to do the wrong things, prick our heart, mind, and spirit that we would change. Help us to recognize that we can't change on our own. We can only change as you enable us to change. So let us rush to you, Lord. Show us our heart and the things that need to be changed. We ask, Lord, for mercy over this country. That you would change hardened hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would move as only you can move, that you would protect us, that you would lead us and guide us, that you would deliver us. Father, we ask, Lord, all these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. All right, family, have a blessed day, and I will see you Saturday. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining us for the Elroy Child Podcast here on TheVoice17104.com with your host, Reverend Barb Ellery. Make sure you join us and mark your calendar every second and fourth Tuesday, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. for more of the Elroy's Child broadcast. Remember today you are fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image, and that's not all he says about us. It's time for us to walk in our Ephesians 2.10 self as God's unique masterpiece, recognizing he has created us for such a time as this. Go with God. We'll see you next week on the broadcast.